This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What if Joe Biden drops out? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason. My co-host, Liz Wolf, Reason associate editor and author of the Reason Roundup is here. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. President Biden is facing increasing pressure from his own side to drop out of the 2024 race, which nearly every poll taken since his disastrous debate performance last week shows him losing. The latest Real Clear Politics average has him down by about three and a half percentage points nationally. Several Democratic Congress members have called for him to step aside. So have Democratic mega donors. Much of the national press once dismissive of those pointing out Biden's mental deterioration has turned on him. So where do we go from here? To help us begin to answer that, we've invited on David Weigel, a name and face surely familiar to much of our audience. He's a political reporter for (laughs) Semaphore and previously written for the Washington Post, Bloomberg, Slate, and Reason Magazine. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Thanks. Hello to everyone in the Reason comments. I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that the feeling is mutual. Uh, <laughs> let's bring back <clears throat> uh, th- that polling data for a second, uh, John. Um, so this shows the general election kind of compilation of polling. Uh, the spread between Trump and Biden is about, uh, well, it says 3.3 percentage points as of July 8th, or sorry, July 9th. Um, this perhaps even more concerning is a breakdown of the battleground states and every single poll seems to show Trump with a lead or a tie at this point in the electoral process and kind of taking into account history, how bad is it actually for Biden right now? This is unprecedented. I kind of hate that word because lots of things are unprecedented. Uh, no no presidential candidate st- steps in the same river twice. Uh, I try to avoid it in prose, if you can call what's in the newspaper album prose. But <laughs> it is. There has not. There have been incidents in eras where there's an old president and there are questions about whether he should, he should leave the ticket. This happened after uh, Dwight Eisenhower's stroke and he recovered enough. People said, no, he's fine. This was a persistent theme in the early 80s, uh, Reagan's first term. People, people kind of forget. Inflation was bad. Re- Reagan was he, a decade younger than Joe Biden, but old, but the oldest president ever at that point. But he, they just didn't fail to perform at key moments. And that's what changed. Uh, so we'll get into all these all the things happening. But Democrats were very resistant to this idea that Biden was too old to keep going. Uh, in part because of negative polarization. The Republicans had been saying since Biden uh, was running in 2019 that he was too old and he was incompetent and he was going to melt down, he had dementia, et cetera, et cetera. And that clearly wasn't happening in 2020. He was fine. He was fine in 2021. Uh, he would have slip-ups, literally slip-ups. And he slipped on, he fell on Air Force One, uh, the steps, which is the sort of thing that you never live down. Every president tries to avoid looking that bad. It happened to Biden. There was an impression that he was very old, but they told themselves uh, that Republicans are wrong about this. I've seen him up close. He's still sharp up close. I personally, as a reporter, had interacted with him in December. He was much older. I'm from Delaware. He was my senator when I was growing up. Yes, he was much older. He was much slower. He moved slower. He talked slower. He wasn't extemporaneous like he used to be. Uh, But but they got it locked into the Biden nomination. They got locked in. I'm not trying to be passive about it. They decided to nominate him. Uh, just stuck on this idea of 2021, 2022 Biden. And I, I'm being pretty generous be, because I covered him up close and he wasn't as bad before the land debate as he was there. That was a, the nightmare sim- scenario. Everything from his affect to his uh, way he answered questions, his ability to land the line, to just his voice. Uh, this is the worst version of the Biden voice we've heard. It is raspier, like a lot of o- older older Americans, older people get raspier as they get older. This is this is common. Uh the coughing, needing a glass of water, etc. Everything about him was was so bad in the debate that Democrats are reckoning with something that they were denying for several years. What you said you saw him in December. Yeah. Was how would you compare 
then the Biden then versus what we saw at the debate? Uh, in December is a White House event where he had to read remarks and he stuck to the remarks and, and just, I wouldn't say he wasn't reading the room, but he wasn't being extemper again, not being extemporaneous. He used to be able to kind of go back and forth. Uh, was greeting people afterward. It was slow in the greeting. Uh, he wasn't forgetting his place, but he wasn't being challenged. It wasn't a high pressure setting where he, he's asked about his his record or he's asked to respond to something Donald Trump said. So in, in a low pressure setting, he was a lot. He he it was recognizable. He was worse in Atlanta. I don't like to do the Bill Frist, the Terry Chivo thing. Yeah. Look at this video. Compare the cur compare this video to that video. Uh -huh. But as somebody who covered him sometimes it one thing the democrats would say uh throughout his presidency is is uh why is the media cover the content of his speeches more and that was fair but when i would cover his speeches he he, he never he was never a, in this iteration 2021 to, to to currently a very dynamic speaker if you listen to an entire 30 minute biden speech on the trail it had good moments and it had stuff that kind of that kind of drifted off uh, he, yeah. th this this Biden habit of uh, making a point and then kind of losing the thread and say anyway and moving to a new point. Just if you watch thirty minutes of Biden speeches throughout his presidency, there were moments that that weren't great. But the debate was worse, and he hadn't been in a back and forth tough setting like that. Even the interviews he's done uh, for this campaign, like the Howard Stern interview, it's not bad. But Howard Stern really likes him and is not pouncing on moments where he's slipping. He just wants him to keep talking. Uh, so. When was the last time Biden was a pressure setting before the, uh, the the land debate? It was a press conference a very long time ago. One thing that strikes me as malfeasance is, you know, the debate was held at the end of June. We're now recording this in mid-July. Um, and the story that the White House keeps sticking with is that the president was examined and evaluated for, you know, cognitive related issues and dementia uh, back in February. And at least having watched, yeah. uh, you know, old people in my life, especially my father-in-law who had Parkinson's, I mean, I'm sorry, but over the course of from February to the end of June, sometimes there were maybe symptoms that are there, but then there's this, it's not always progressing in this linear fashion. At least to me, it feels as though the White House is being, you know, odd in not disclosing and not, not attempting to seek, you know, greater evaluation uh, at regular intervals. Mm -hmm. What type of obligation do you think the White House has um, on a medical transparency, on the medical transparency front to uh, disclose what's going on with Biden? Or is this sort of a privacy issue? Oh, the, the under the system we have where the president is the head of state and, and needs to respond at a hair trigger to crises, I don't think it's bad to say we, there's an annual physical and we're going to reveal the with consistency the results of the physical. Because the White House... It, it did this in 2021. Mm -hmm. It revealed that he took blood thinners. Uh, he His doctors said that he, yes, he had a stiffer gait as a result of aging and because of an injury right right before he sworn in, he broke his foot. And if you're if you're an old person and you have an injury, and we've encountered this with my parents, you don't bounce back the way a teenager bounces back or a 40-something bounces back. I mean, it sticks with you. Uh, so they admitted that, that stuff. The... The neurological part of this, again, that's there's not a ton of precedent for this. The last time it was asked in a serious way was was for Ronald Reagan, uh, and while Reagan was slipping at points in his in his second term, and that, that was reported a little bit at the time, much more af afterward, there wasn't a precedent set. Hey, if we have questions about the pre if the president's brain is working, we need to be transparent about this. I, I'm not trying to filibuster your question. Say there is yeah. this has not been laid out because normally presidents are in an age range where this is not a question. It's hard to win the election if people have serious questions about this. We were in a odd situation in 2020 where most voters thought, well, I'm going to the polls, the exit polls. Most voters thought we have two candidates who are quite old and are weird mentally in different ways. And we're choosing Biden because he seems fine right now. And, and so there, there wasn't, it's not the way that you need to release your finances or uh, uh, show your time what did you did with her salary as, as as Trump used to do? Yeah, there's not there's not a standard for this. And in that penumbra, Democrats were just not revealing a lot about him. I don't think I, I think there's a little bit of egg on some faces from the from the Parkinson's conversation mm -hmm. because it's, it's complicated. The, the White House was working on a part uh, with Congress on a Parkinson's 
bill, a science funding bill at the same time this was happening. Uh, but yes, if the, if the president is sick for some reason, the reason to back up, the reason you don't say, hey, the president is sick today and he can't do his functions. Uh, the president has to go to the hospital. The reason you don't broadcast that is because as an as an imperial <laughs> world power, uh, there are foreign adversaries who might take advantage of those moments. That's the reason you don't do it. That's the reason you're very clear. If uh, the president has to go, this happened with George Bush, with every president, you have to go under for an operation. The vice president is technically in charge for a few hours. This mm-hmm. happens sometimes. You're very careful about it. So for the same reason, you don't say, all right, well, the assessment says he's slipping a little bit because that's dangerous. It it creates real problems if the president has a medical condition. If you back away from Biden, if there was a president, President X right now, who had um, an FDR, well, I don't need to, an FDR sort of heart condition. Was it, what, what was, what was the, what was the benefit for the country of, of people not being aware of how sick FDR was and he was reelected, uh, closing out World War II? What would it turned out to be the very final months of World War II? Uh, I think it's pretty clear the country was was denied facts about how close to death FDR was and in a very different media environment. It, and some of the reasons were, were you could defend them. It, do we want Hitler and Hirohito to know how sick FDR is? Probably not. Uh, but there's not been a, a, a rule for, for this sort of thing. Again, just because... In a, in a republic, usually the, the electorate says, we're worried about this person being too old and sick and we won't vote for them. And that just didn't happen in 2020. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to try to understand. And th- this is not something we're necessarily going to be able to get to in this conversation. But in the coming weeks, we need to understand as a public what who knew what when that's partly why mm-hmm. i was asking you your impressions of right. biden in december uh because i wanted to talk a little bit about a very interesting article published on july 4th by olivia nutzi in uh the new in new york mag magazine um called the conspiracy of silence to protect joe biden and uh, She paints a portrait of an inner circle of donors, all unnamed, who were privately panicking as they observed Biden's mental and physical decline, uh, as well as staffers who for months would whisk him away from the press that follows him everywhere. And I just love to get your insight, Dave, as a longtime DC based political (laughs) reporter, like how could this happen? How could the press, like many who have, of whom just regularly observe Biden up close or have colleagues who do so, seem to be so blindsided by what unfolded on the debate stage? Because I'm not defending it at all. I'm just trying to explain it. Uh, yeah. One part of it, again, just saying where the what the context was, is... Republicans had claimed in 2019 and 20 that Biden was inco- it was incompetent. And if you were covering the 2020 campaign as a reporter, uh, the narrative that they're, of the basement campaign, they can't put Biden out in public because he has dementia. He's, he's ailing. Uh, that was de- debunked in in the debates. He did fine. He was older and slower than he had been in 2012 and 2016. But that memory that lasted. And really, the first uh, the first year of the Biden administration he would slip on some things again, literally. Uh, but I think it was just the, not even the sunk cost, but the but the bias of being close to this and seeing, well, he's always been old and he slipped a little today, but uh, then he'll have a good day tomorrow. And it, it, it's a very odd thing to talk about. We are talking about this the way we do talk about a grandfather. No one has, a, I don't think anyone has a grandparent who is that age and is mostly good. And you think, well, in a month, it might be terrible. He might be in a nursing home. You think, I hope he's good for the rest of the rest of his his time. I, should the press be considering the pre- the president as a parent? I don't think so, or a grandparent. Um, but that, without interviewing every member of the press corps, I think that was part of it. Is if you had you were seeing so you were seeing coverage that was not matching up with what you saw. Biden gives a thirty minute speech. It's fine. It's a little bit slow, but then he leaves it kind of kind of slowly and shuffling. And if yeah. the me- the media coverage or the Twitter TikTok coverage you saw was just ten seconds of him walking away slowly, you as a reporter would say ah, that's a little unfair. He's an old man, but he he handled the press conference. The thing that, you, that they're referring to with uh, 
with donors, though, that's important. Uh, there was not enough reporting, and I'm, I'm not trying to absolve myself. I'm just I'm not nor, I'm not in the pool of White House reporters who cover Biden all the time. Mm -hmm. There were there were Biden events uh, and fundraisers, things where he was on stage late, things where he was speaking to an audience, uh, and he was worse than he'd been a year ago or six months prior to those. And that wasn't the media's story. The one one example of this is the event with uh, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, the fundraiser. Uh, where Biden's sort of waving to the stage and is ushered off by Barack Obama. The video of this that goes viral is somebody's, I'm, I'm saying phone, phone camera, because it looked, it was great enough. Yeah, I think it was in wait, the audience. Hold, hold one yeah. second on that, Dave, because we yeah, actually sure. have that clip. And it, yeah, yeah. I think it's important to go over it um, because yeah. it, it really exemplifies something to me. Um, before we get to it real quick, though, um, I want to linger on uh, Nutzi's uh, story in yeah. uh, New York Magazine, uh, because there's this one passage that stuck out to me where she's describing the president being whisked away uh, at a reception uh, late last year. And the guest realizes it's probably because Biden's not going to make it through the reception. And this is how she describes the guest's reaction. Uh, she says the guest wasn't sure they could vote for Biden since the guest was now open to an idea that they had previously dismissed as right wing propaganda. The president may not really be the acting president after all. Um, I think people who are quick yeah. to call things that upset them right wing propaganda need yeah. to take a minute to absorb this. You you can't call everything that makes Democrats look bad right-wing propaganda right up until the moment where it's undeniable and even a little past that point sometimes. Like partisan propaganda is is a real thing especially during campaign season and it comes from both sides. But like every sort of face plant like this makes it harder to for everyone to recognize the actual deception and I've got my ideas about how to best correct for this problem, but I would like to hear yours as well, Dave. Oh, I, yeah, I do want to hear your ideas. Yeah, with, what Nuzzi's piece is reflecting a couple things. What it is typical for the president to be ushered away from reporters. That's another thing I think reporters had antibodies about if they saw, oh, uh, there was one incident where it's the Easter egg roll and Biden's starting to take some Afghanistan questions and the staffer who dressed the Easter bunny helps usher him away. And this became a big a big talking point at Republican <laughs> rallies. He's he's so out of it the Easter Bunny had to take him away. That did look silly, but that's that happens sometimes where the White House wants to control how much the guy's on camera. But really, Alex Thompson at Axios is one of the few reporters, and for this he was frozen out of access. That's kind of the story I think I'll get to. Alex Thompson at Axios is is one of the the the, the top reporters covering the administration, top at his outlet, uh, uh, and. He writes stories that are that there's not a policy angle. He just will point out, hey, uh, Biden is taking a different route up to Air Force One that's shorter than he used to. He's going to a different part of the plane. So there's fewer steps. Biden is instead of walking solo to the helicopter because that produces footage of him looking old and shuffling. He's now walking with a few staff, not surrounded, not like a phalanx, but enough where the image is now of a president with his team, not the president walking alone. He was just noticing those atmospherics. And the White House just did not. There are reporters who got more access to the White House than Alex Thompson because mm -hmm. that's part of that's part of the game. It is the 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 hatred people have access journalism uh, is rooted in something. I mean, if you, but with Trump, does, who gets more interviews with Donald Trump? Uh, Sean Hannity, who never asked him anything hard, or a reporter who might grind him down on something embarrassing. Sean Hannity does. Uh, they they make this choice, but it, it's usually in the context of I. All of it is in the framework of let's not have the president say something off message, which gets a lot harder if the president looks and sounds old and is occasionally screwing things up. So that's part of the reason. Uh, why did I think the coverage in the the Times uh, by Katie Rogers, those people, has been has been very good. The coverage in the Post has been good, uh, but the story they there also was a little bit of I wouldn't maybe audience capture is almost the right term. Uh, if you're a reporter writing about Biden and you focus on the age. Uh, question, you get just drowned by the readers of newspapers, who at this point are mostly more liberal, college-educated, more democratic, saying, how dare you do this? And this happened, uh, my friend Annie Linsky, who I worked with at The Post, uh, co-authored this Wall Street Journal story about 
whether Biden had been slipping in public based on interviews, mostly on record quotes coming from Republicans. And they got hammered for it. They got hammered by readers. Uh, they got skeptical treatment. Part of this, I think, is the crabs they in the barrel seem, thing. Where, they still seem to yeah. be getting hammered, by the way, even now. Yeah. Uh, if you look at you know the comments sections to the New York Times now, even with this all out in the open, there's still yeah. this you know backlash. That's but happening. journalists aren't supposed to have yeah. you know fidelity to the comment sections, right? I mean, fundamentally, journalists have to be interrogating whether or not they're is a deeper commitment that they have, which should ostensibly to, you know, be reporting the truth as they can suss it out. Um, and it really, we perhaps journalists need to do self-reflection to understand that they should not be so beholden to their liberal skewing audiences, but rather like call it like you see it a little bit more. I mean, I think we see a little mm-hmm. bit of, I mean, New York Times is doing extremely well, but there's a little bit of market feedback um, that we're seeing as a lot of these very sort of They're... like left wing bias, increasingly lefty biased newspapers have financial issues or go under. I mean, it turns out just telling your readers what they want to hear over and over again versus accurately reporting the news as you see it isn't actually necessarily yeah. a winning strategy. Yes. And, and I, I'm diagnosing more than I am. I am ju- judging about yeah. this because I've seen Absolutely. iterations of this. Uh Back in 2014, uh, there, Senator Tad Cochran of Mississippi was running for re-election. He was clearly mentally in decline. Uh, he was not doing interviews. If he did events, you, you had that at a smaller version because the Senate campaign, you've got a couple staff. You had a few reporters. I remember covering it with a, a small, smallish, maybe like half a dozen people at events. And he had a conservative primary challenger and Republicans wanted him to win because they didn't want to deal with this conservative primary challenger in the Senate. Uh, and it was clear that McDaniel, <laughs> that, that, that um, sorry, that Ted Cochran uh, couldn't do the job. And he ended up resigning midterm and then he ended up dying before what would have been the end of his term. There's a Cindy Hyde Smith is a senator from Mississippi because uh, Republicans in Mississippi basically misled people on how astute the guy was and and argued for him to get reelected. I covered Diane Feinstein running for reelection in 2018. And I remember talking to Democrat her team at the time. Uh, and one, they were, didn't want to deal with the aging question, but their premise is basically, look, she, this Democratic senator, everyone who she, she is, she's going to win re-election. Every dollar we don't have to spend on this race is a, a dollar that we can spend in a, in a tough state. So just let, let's get her reelected. There is something that happens in, uh, in America more than, I'd, I'd say more than other countries because of the, uh, the, the, the system we have, the set, the, 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 the the three branch system where somebody who has to seek reelection occasionally can be incompetent and get reelected anyway. And how does the press deal with those questions? One thing that happened in Mississippi was that um, Tea Party activists who were correct. <laughs> one of them um, tried to do some citizen journalism of, uh, of of Cochran's wife at a nursing home. I don't think it would have been a very good story, but the Republicans behind Cochran very smartly reacted to this as a huge invasion of privacy uh, the guy was, I think, criminally charged. It ruined his life. Uh, but they, they really set up this wall of protection around him. And the way the media covered Cochran, I, I think for my stories of Slade at the time, he had just re- reflected the story. He's not saying much. He's not doing much. He's refusing to debate. Uh, but how can you get into his head? You don't have a neuro, you don't have the neuroscience. You don't have the medical report on it. This happens. It's never happened with the president. Uh, but what is the what is the press's role when this is happening? I, th- I, I clearly. To be to be very direct with people here, and maybe, maybe this is this is why I think Alex Thompson is doing it right. What is being done differently than a middle aged president who or a middle aged politician who is not in decline? How are they managing this? What? How much shorter is is the interview? It, in Morning Joe, for example, he's calling in. He's not doing it in studio or on video. What are they doing to protect him, and why are they doing it? Uh, I to, interpreted the to, calling to that, in yeah, as sorry, sort of folksy, like, was, wasn't that just like a folksiness stunt, right? As opposed to, or was that, do you think that there was a sense that he couldn't sit for actual, an actual video hit? Well, <laughs> I, it's a little bit the of a stunt, speaker. but. Yeah, it seems a little bit more. But the White House has, has uh, multiple places for a president to go to the camera with a, with a yeah. link and go, or. Uh, Morning Joe is um, it's filmed in D.C., but sometimes the hosts are, are remote. I want to get too much in the weeds on that. Uh, but but there are examples of just why is Biden doing the interview in this setting and not and not doing your not doing more. A question that probably was it did force some coverage, but I think was more revealing in retrospect was Biden didn't do this, the Super Bowl interview. And reporters yep. were asking, 
why is he not doing the Super Bowl interview? And the and the White House ha- and Democrats had some uh, throw dust in the air reasons about this, but it, there wasn't a good answer. It, it, it's free media, and if a president is is able to do it, it's never bad for him. Uh, Barack Obama used to sit down with Bill O'Reilly, and it wasn't a friendly interview, and it was good TV, and Barack Obama would do fine. They so I think part of the question here is. Not to get very existential about what news is, <laughs> but news is generally <laughs> there's it. an event that happened, and the next day there's a new event that happened, and it's a it's a iterative story, but there's not news every day that the president is very old. Uh, <laughs> it, so there, Except if the you become that reporter, if you become this... Alex Thompson, who again was correct, you're the reporter who covers his age. You are away from the pack. I'm not. I, I really am c- no. careful because I don't want to indict people who are doing a hard job covering the president every day. I don't think they. La- la- we're in a conspiracy to do this, but just the, the waking up and just the, like a White House staffer saying, "Well, I'm working for a president who's declining, but uh, it's going to work out somehow." I feel well, like what? people just settled yeah. for something, not in a conspiratorial way, but in a well, it'd be weird to just write about how old he is every day. So we're not doing that. But one thing that's so telling about the last two weeks is that is precisely what has been doing. This has been the story yeah. that has very much gripped the nation's attention. Um, and it feels as though each day there's like another little right. new development in it, right? Like the Congressional Black mm-hmm. Caucus was uh, in the news, I think, like on Monday of this week that we're recording. So on July 8th, and there was a little bit of like, OK, Biden attempting to rally black legislators around him. But then lots of leaks and revelations that actually, you know, those ranks were sort of there were fractures in those ranks. Um, now there's some interesting stories about like, what's the squad's angle in backing up Biden and being so right. rank and file here for him? I mean, one thing that I also think was telling about the MSNBC interview in particular was Biden's attempt to blame the Democratic Party elites on the fact that this is a story. And it's like, well, sir, you have uh, been in the U.S. Senate or in national politics since checks notes 1972 like i'm sorry but like you're the literal sitting president and you've been in politics for 50 years he's attempting to really do a little bit of this like elite versus man of the people type thing and you know attempting to posture himself as uh the candidate who can speak to black voters specifically and then we're also seeing at the same time this is all happening Mm. trump attempting to make some really interesting inroads. Obviously, Rust Belt has been a priority for his, but now there's a lot of focus on Pennsylvania as a swing state because of how devastating that would be for Biden to be losing it. And so with a vice presidential announcement coming probably in the next few days, next two or three days, possibly. It has to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not Vance will be sort of Trump's means of shoring up Pennsylvania specifically. And I, the thing that I think is just so captivating is it's not as if there's just one single story, which is like, you know, Biden diagnosed, you know, as somebody struggling with dementia or struggling with Parkinson's or just Biden had a bad performance on the debate stage. But it's, in fact, kind of stunning the people who will back him up, the people who knew about this, the people who were hiding it for a long time. And then I think also a lot of people are sort of grappling with the idea that, like, well, what exactly are the sort of top brass of the Democratic Party for if they don't actually have the cojones to be able to communicate to Biden that this is that he's not a viable candidate at this point and that there's frankly very little hope for him to win in a lot of these swing states at this point. But that under- that's what's new as we're talking is Democrats yeah. saying uh, actually after three years of saying this election is a choice of democracy maybe we're heading towards a, a surefire loss and I, I've been pointing out there this has happened in both both of both the last presidential election there was a point where Republican donors panicked and said Trump's going to lose so we're going to focus on holding the House of Senate now. But for Democrats to do this after arguing that Trump is an existential threat is a, is a lot is a lot harder uh, from the Democrats perspective. So you're right it, it, for him criticizing the elites, what he is doing and Trump does the same thing. Trump is a former president. He criticized the elites uh, in the kind of, um, you know, Rothbard and uh, could have been a way of there is in a, a permanent elite in the cathedral, et cetera. Uh, what Biden was Biden has referred to, he has been lucky in that there are a bunch of really goofy Democratic donors just spitting out ideas to undermine the Democratic pro- the Democratic Party process and say this looks hard. Let's kick let's kick out the vice president and pick a new popular ticket of people I see on TV a lot. He, that I think that went pretty well for him. Um, but the the Democratic Party infrastructure, yes, it 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 support it has supported him since he won the nomination. He took it over as president. The reason that one reason that there weren't primary debates, there were probably never going to be anyway, because it's the it's up to the party to coordinate with network and set them up they had a vote at the dnc meeting in winter 2023 that just said we 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 support our presumptive nominee joe biden therefore we're going to raise funds with joe biden he's basically the nominee it's party party rule stuff that 
they're allowed to do. The Republicans couldn't do it because technically they had a primary for Donald Trump. Only when he won could they could they do that thing. But yes, the Democratic Party was totally behind him. And the decision that I, I think again, the decision they made of giving them a lot of credit is is a lot like what happened in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. It if you were a Democrat in 2014 and 15. You had seen polling that showed Hillary Clinton with a 65% approval rating. Most people thought she was a good Secretary of State. You'd lived through periods where she was unpopular, but then you said, well, look, and then look at 2008. Look at the most recent past performance. She was really popular in Rust Belt states that Biden's, that, uh, sorry, that Obama struggled in. So surely that will happen again. Uh, and it took them obviously too long, fatally too long to realize that Hillary's image was very different, that she was a weaker candidate. For a number of reasons, but also that the uh, home the homebrew server investigation was not going to go away because there are things the Clintons had been accused of that went away. Voters said, "Fine, we're going to put that aside. We'll vote for her anyway." They just were in denial about it. Something similar happened with Biden, where Democrats said, "We again, we were told in 2020 he was too old. They were wrong. We were told he was going to lose the midterms. He didn't. So we're just going to assume his past performance dictates how he's going to be in the future, and we're going to stick with him." And we're not going to do the hard risk assessment of what happens if he ages really quickly. Um, and I'm just sorry, I, I, I want to forget that, right? Just again, this all, we're all, all, all in all of this premise. There, there are pe- old people, and then something they hit a point where they they uh, are never quite the same again. They they are old, they're able to do everything, then they fall in the shower and they can't. You know, you know what I'm referring to? They just didn't consider that possibility. So obviously, yes, the Democratic Party apparatus, which Biden had shaped as president, made that bet. They they said he was too old and he wasn't, so we're just going to stick with him. And it, I think this it was the same logical fallacies that they went through in 2016. Everyone says this is going to be a problem for Hillary Clinton, but we know her, and our recent evidence says that she's fine. So stop telling us it's not going to be fine. I think that one of the most damaging aspects of this long term is just another hit to credibility across the board, both the credibility. Oh, yeah of the administration and unfortunately the media, you know, you have this question you raise of like, what should the media do? I think is a tough one, but partially can be answered by looking at what they should not do. And, look. you know, this example that you brought up earlier, I, it, I, I want to look okay. at what I consider to be a prime example of the kind of gaslighting that we endured about Biden's mental state in the weeks running up to the debate. We saw a lot of videos, many of them, to be fair, clipped by explicitly partisan outlets like RNC Research, which should always put the viewer on high alert. But at the end of the day, you can see something's wrong, even if it's coming from a dubious source. So let's look at Biden on stage at a fundraiser with Obama and Jimmy Kimmel in LA in mid-June, a couple weeks before the debate. So yeah, there's just kind of, this is just kind of like the outro. They're waving goodbye to the crowd. Um, I'm just describing this for our audio listeners. Biden's sort of standing frozen in the middle of the stage. Barack Obama reaches over, kind of tugs his arm a little bit and then escorts him off stage. And it, yeah, it, it looks from that angle to me like uh, it's Obama. That That's what I saw first. I saw that, that cell phone clip, right? Biden being led off stage by Obama. But then I was told by the Daily Beast that this was Trump world trotting out another, quote, cheap fake video of President Biden Um, and then linking to a video posted to X by a White House correspondent that implores me to fact check before sharing nonsense and then shows this version of the clip. Can we play that, John? So this looks like to be the official Biden, Joe Biden.com version. And then they cut to an extreme wide shot where you cannot <laughs> see what's happening whatsoever. And this yeah. is the fact check that we're supposed to uh, believe that, you know, the other one is, is a cheap fake. Someone here is trying to deceive me and it doesn't seem like it's Trump world or the New York post. And 
I'm not a Trump fan. I've never voted for him or supported him, but this stuff drives me crazy. And it's exactly how we ended up in this situation. Do you think there's any hope of a course correction or some self-reflection from the people who behave this way? Uh, that, that's why I've been careful about how Biden has changed. I, cause I was at a, a conference in DC, this NatCon this week where Stephen Miller was speaking about how the democratic party, he focused up more on Democrats than the media, but you could, you could rewrite the speech to be about the media and say that there was a three and a half year conspiracy, the greatest conspiracy of all time to conceal that Biden was incompetent. And he was not running the country. And I was uh, being annoyingly pedantic and saying, well, Go back and look at him in 2021. It was the, the you weren't seeing these stories because he was not he didn't look that he didn't look and sound that bad. I I, I pulled up early sp speeches, press conferences, interviews. He was he was not as slippery. Even his Afghanistan withdrawal uh, press conference, which is one of the low points of this presidency. If you remember that the timing of that was he didn't come out and say anything immediately. It took a few days. Once he did a press conference, it was very tense, but he answered the questions fine. Something had he got worse as he got older. Uh, and so how does the media, how do the, how do Democrats regain credibility? I would think they need to be honest. And some of them are going to have to just eat crow and say, you know, I saw I, a version of the, the, this, <laughs> I'm not trying to write their speeches for them. Uh, <laughs> they might, they might have to say that. what you're starting to hear a little bit of, which is uh, he was always strong in my interactions with him, but he, he did decline. I, I, I was wrong about this. I, I think Matt, Matt Iglesias, uh, uh, now it's slow boring, had the yeah. version of this that I think if more de if, if everyone the, if, if everyone had a version of that and saying, I was basing my my takes on my limited experience and I didn't realize how bad it had gotten until later and I'm sorry for that. I don't think everyone, not everyone who reads Matt Iglesias is convinced by anything he says, but... That was convincing to me because I do think people who've been covering Biden on and off just saw a different Biden later later in the campaign. So yeah, I think there there should be some mea me culpas. I'm only just being cautious, saying I don't think you need to apologize for saying in 2020 Biden looks like he can handle the job. But if you were saying on June 26 that that he can, that, for example, I was at the debate, um, the media part of the debate in the, in the Georgia Tech uh, arena. The Democrat, the candidates were across the street. That's pretty typical. Secret Service guards where the debate is, media's elsewhere. And the last conversation I had with a Biden spinner before the debate was with Gavin Newsom. And I asked him, all right, you've been at the center of all the speculation that Biden will have to be replaced. Do you think that ends tonight? I was not trying to be cheeky. I really, I thought that was a potential story. If Biden looked really good, maybe that stops. If he looked really bad, here we are. We know what happened. And Newsom was just saying, yeah, that ends 100%. I, I, this is the, uh, it should have ended two years ago. The man that I, I know is very strong. I, I have the quote somewhere in front of me. I'll do the whole thing. But his answer was, I don't think, squareable with what Biden did on stage. And I think there are Democrats who got way over their skis saying, don't worry about it. Who need to explain themselves? I don't think in the press, I mean, I did. I, the, if you wrote a cheap fake story, uh, <laughs> you can defend it by saying, yeah, there's just a litany of clips that are out of context. But we should have been more blunt and honest that actually Biden has gotten a lot older and, and he looks really bad at these events. And I didn't tell you. Uh, it just uh, feels so kind of like it's, this, it's complicated. Uh, it feels yeah. like this feedback loop, though, because like they're yeah, yeah. the media writing these cheap fake stories. And then you've got Biden's se press secretary going up on the podium and saying all this is cheap fake. And then normal people are just looking at these clips and seeing the reality and being told that they're being deceived by cheap fakes and then like two weeks later it's undeniable so yeah uh, and, and and i think that's it's resulted in a uh, huge embarrassment and there's now been a shift in tone like many in the press seem to feel betrayed by like like i there's some people who i think that in i, I don't think everyone in the press was like involved in some sort of cover-up i think there are people who maybe weren't seeing Biden in person and were just taking the word of their colleagues or the characterizations coming out of the White House at face value. And now they right. feel betrayed. And there's seems to have been a shift in tone, uh, which I, I want to show an example of it in this clip of uh, the White, White House press sec secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, being pressed very hard about the, the appearances of this Parkinson specialist on the White House visitor logs, 
Um, let's roll that clip because I think it it shows something. It shows something about the shift in tone that we've seen. John, could you roll that? He gets every year that we provide to all of you. That's a very basic, direct question. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Wait a second. Eight times, or at least once, in regards to the president specifically. Hold on a second. You should be able to answer by this point. Wait, no, 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 no. No, wait a minute. Ed, please. A little respect here, please. So every year around the, the president's physical examination, he sees a neurologist. That's three times, right? So I am telling you that he has seen a neurologist three times while he has been in this presidency. That's you what I'm saying. I am telling you that he has seen them three times. That is what I'm sharing with you, right? So every time he has a physical, he has had to see a neurologist. So that is answering that question. No, it's not. No, it is. It yes, is. You're Dr. asking Kevin me. Kennard, come I to can't. The White House I just. And I also said to you, condition. Ed. I also said to you, for security reasons, we cannot share names. Okay, so I hope we get some real answers <laughs> about this because I still am not sure what to think, and I'm very happy to see it being pressed. But what does it mean for Biden to be dealing with a more hostile media now? Uh, you could you could see it. I, I, I have talked to Republican comms people have been very happy in the past week for lots of reasons. One of them is they say they had to deal with this all the time. If you work for Trump, you had to deal with this sort of question all the time. Biden was not getting the I think he, he was getting hostile questions. But uh, one nice American tradition, I think, is that Fox News is in the front row and Peter Ducey is able to ask really questions that clearly irritate the White House and they have to mm -hmm. answer them. That's been a nice that's been a nice process. But yes, the. The, they are not dealing with a press a press corps anymore that is willing to just not pay attention to things Biden is slipping on and and this is um again what is different from uh, compared to two weeks ago if Biden gives a speech and and he slips up a little bit uh, that would not have been the lead the first time it is the lead now it's like somebody coming back to the field after an injury you weren't looking at uh, how his knee moved before and you are now is, is that knee going to hold or is it going to snap on, on the field that's how he's being covered and when it comes to the actual information being demanded the white house yes it's it sound it seemed collectively gauche to ask medical record questions because you were hearing from the front row fox asked them or from a couple of behind uh newsmax james rosen who used to work, work for fox i'm just getting very weedsy about the briefing room but there there were a couple of garden party skunks in the briefing room who would ask Biden health questions. And the response was always, oh, that's a little bit, that's a little bit rude. Why ask that? You saw, mm -hmm. you saw this with Rosen was the guy who kind of chimed in uh, last week and said, if he's, <laughs> if he's awake, uh, when Jean-Pierre was answering something and it was NBC's Kelly O'Donnell who said that's inappropriate. There still is. A I mean, is, is that part of the answer, yeah. though? Like, does the press yeah. need to just become well, a little more comfortable being uh, I mean, it's particularly the, the access press, the people that are in the room, in yes. the White House briefing room. Do they just does that culture of just being a little more blunt and rude need to kind of be reinvigorated? Yeah, but in, in fairness, also, it's the it's Politico. And I think the post a few people, a few media outlets are suing for the Robert Hur's mm -hmm. audio tape. So you, the White House released the transcript. It's refused. Sorry, the, the DOJ has released the, the transcript of Biden's interview with Robert Hur yeah, over the I document investigation. Here. And it's media outlets that are also saying we want to see this. So. Um, whatever you think of the media outlets, Politico is not trying to do Biden and this, a favor. Just, is, to, is, just, so, yeah. just so everyone knows what you're talking about, Dave, yeah. this is from this was yeah, yeah, the, sure. the infamous part of that document where they declined to charge Biden for the uh, mishandling of classified documents because they argued that Biden would likely present himself to a jury as he did during our interview of him as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory um, and right. it would be hard to prosecute a former president well into his 80s of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. And at the time, people were freaking out and saying that this was totally inappropriate. And now reading that, I'm like, yeah, that's that adds up, that tracks with well, what I've observed of Biden. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem out of line at all. One thing that I yeah. find really quite disturbing is that it was a fellow reporter who chimed in to say that's inappropriate. That would, I think, be a reasonable um, 
you know, slapped mm. down, like put down coming right. from Karine Jean-Pierre, but coming from a fellow reporter to me, that seems as if it's like, you know, the right. reporters themselves, like to me, that says something about the reporter who said that, right? The fact right. that they feel the need to almost like stand up for Biden or vouch for him in that way. Like, I'm sorry, like, it's kind of not your job as a fellow reporter to police that. Yeah, this is, I'm sure if I, if I can package this really quickly, because it's one of my, one of my hobby horses and it can sound, it got loopy, but. I, I used to live in the UK. In the UK, the political press has way less deference to its its political leaders. Uh, if you watch the any of the forums they just had in their election, the everyone knew Keir Starmer was going to be prime minister, and he would just get grinded down with questions about how he lied or how he slipped on a policy or how he and none of the questions about competence. Just there are questions that are much ruder than you get here. But well, it's like there's not a press corps in the UK. Tabloid culture in the UK is right. like incredibly antagonistic and intense, yeah. right? Oh, right. But but then there's also the royals and there's a tabloid culture yeah. that covers the royals. But the official royal press corps famously is just it just like it missed mm -hmm. the health scares uh, of the royal family because it is it is pretty deferential. And we have mm -hmm. in this country, because mm -hmm. it's a presidential system, the president is the king and also the prime minister. And there's always been this this mix, this mixture of how to cover him in the press corps. There is an access style. There, there are people who cover the first lady as a beat and they're not looking to nail her and bring down the first lady it is we are covering the record the court record um mu much as somebody would have covered louis the 14th of how the first lady of the, we're covering the state dinner what is served at the state dinner and who showed up for the state dinner there is a sort of there uh, literally royal court reporting in the press corps and there's also the tougher reporting you compare this to congress i, th I think congress gets more of this there's not glossy coffee table books about about the house majority leader People are pretty tough on the House Majority Leader, but there is this softer coverage of the president because of the he is the sovereign, and it's one of those things that, as an American, I I I, I get it. I like the Constitution, but I I do get to envy the other countries where you're not as deferential. And if if a if the leader has like lied or screwed up, they just say, well, obviously he should resign. In this country, it happened once, and and even there's been a refighting of that by concert by conservatives for 50 years. That shouldn't happen. If he's elected, he stays in there. If he makes mistakes, he stays in there. He's the sovereign. He has the mandate of the people. He is, he is anointed by by the American public, etc. That gets into the press corps. So I'm not saying, great, that's what he did. I'm saying, man, I'm jealous <laughs> like, of yeah. the UK press corps. Or the other ones. It's a little more like France, where you know, there is a you know Jupiter, as, as, as uh, Macron kind of called himself. Uh, and that that gets into everything. So that's what you hear when somebody says that's yeah. inappropriate. They wouldn't say I, that. I, if, but if, I mean, if, let's, if Keir let's Starmer be started honest. like nodding yeah. off on camera, they would say, "Why did Keir Starmer not off on camera? This is an appropriate yeah. question to ask." Hmm. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest though. Like Trump did bring out some of that in the press just because he yeah. was such a combative figure himself. Um, it's just would be nice if some more of that combativeness kind of, you know, stayed uh, or was, was held over because maybe we would have avoided finding ourselves uh, in this situation right now. Um, I, I want to say that you want me to be a White House press corps. I think that is the answer we're converging on right blunt. now. Uh, um, are you how betrayed do you feel, Zach? Actually, I wanted to ask as a Biden voter. Um, <laughs> this No, literally, you did vote for Biden this past time, right? I yep. mean, do you how how do you, how are you grappling with this um, devastating news? Well, I did not uh, vote for I, Biden, so my hands are totally clean here. I mean, <laughs> interestingly, part of my rationale, you know, reason we publish our votes, uh, all the staff members publish their votes every year, mm -hmm. which I think is is good practice. I'd I'd like to see more mm -hmm. um, political, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, media outlets that cover politics do that. But um, yeah, my, th this was my first time ever voting for a Democratic president, and my reasons were twofold. Uh, one was that um, I did think that uh, Trump was becoming unhinged. I didn't like what he was saying he was going to do and then eventually did end up doing when he lost the election. And secondly, um, Biden, uh, I thought that there would be some benefit. I think I even put that... Uh, having a kind of frail, feeble president would be a good corrective to the sort of uh, egoistic energy that has uh, built up in the White House, uh, particularly after Obama and Trump being these like kind of cult of personality like figures. It would be nice to kind of like demystify it with this frail figure. I didn't foresee just how frail and feeble he would become, although I, I thought it was a possibility. And honestly, I was hoping and 
even thinking that he would not seek a second term. Like I thought he, this was going to be, this was kind of like a pause button and we're going to, the you know, the best case scenario, the Republicans are going to figure out some better path forward. The Democrats are going to figure out some better path forward and we can put this unpleasantness behind us. And that did not happen at all. So I guess that's what I feel most betrayed by is that this system produced Trump v. Biden 2.0. Um, and there's something very wrong about that. Hmm. Were you perhaps naive to think that anyone would willingly relinquish political power? Perhaps. Yeah. And but that, that brings me to what I wanted to talk about next with Dave, which was which is Biden's side of this story, because hmm. he obviously has yeah, yeah. defied calls to drop out. And as Liz mentioned, he started to sound a little Trumpian. It's the elites mm -hmm. who wanted to drop out. All the journalists have always been wrong about him. Let's play the clip of Biden on the tarmac uh, answering questions about dropping out and reflect on that. How did you get close? Here? I thought it was a good interview. I'll be able to see it at 8 o'clock tonight. It's, you're going to be recorded off. Are you going to drop out of the race or are you completely ruling that out? Completely ruling that out. Mr. President, how can you um, pursue a case that the democracy is at risk, that you are the best candidate to beat Donald Trump? Because I've beat him before and I've gotten more done than any president has. Have you spoken to members of Congress? No, it was, it was, but uh, you've been wrong about everything so far. Really. You were wrong about 2020. You were wrong about 2022. We were going to get wiped out. Remember the red wave? You were wrong about 2023. When you said all the tough races were going to, we won them all but two. So look, We'll see. I mean, he's not wrong, right? Is Does Biden have a point there? Yeah. Uh, well, one, you hear by the, the, the very stubborn Biden that everyone got to know. The Biden's image has changed over time. The Biden of the 80s was seen as a very arrogant comer uh, who, uh, chancer, I guess, the push forward, who just would try anything to get power. The Biden of the Obama era was seen as a elder statesman who got along with everybody, and that's what he carried in the campaign. But he's always had this chip. And I remember uh, being at a press conference with him, or a gaggle, because it was after an event in Iowa, and uh, a number of us were standing around him. But the news of that day, this is 2019, was that he was flipping on the Hyde Amendment. He went from, I'm for the Hyde Amendment, restricting uh, federal funding for abortion, to I'm going to be opposed to it now. Because this is a thing that uh, abortion groups were demanding, abortion rights groups. And I, I was next to Isaac Dover from CNN, who was going back and forth. And it just Biden, he was not mean to him, but he was saying, I've read your stuff. And he's just like calling out the stuff he'd read. And he could, he can, he can get ordinary if he thinks he's being disrespected. If somebody is telling him how things are and he disagrees, uh, he, he will, he will, it's in a different way than Trump. He, he, he has an arrogant streak and that is coming out. Look, who, who doesn't get more like themselves as they, as they go to older? That has been coming out with Biden. His critique yeah. is is just it's just it's very selective, uh, because in 2019, this is a very comfortable tip because I covered all the candidates uh, in Iowa nonstop and New Hampshire. Uh, that Democrats were focused on electability, Democratic voters. Their worry about Biden was that he was too too old to win. He didn't. He had some bad debates. He mostly had good debates, but they were convinced that he could, he could win this, and he was seen by the press as the best potential Democratic candidate if he got nominated to beat Donald Trump. This really got hardened after the New York Times Siena poll before Iowa that showed Biden was beating Trump in the key states. Elizabeth Warren was not. Bernie was a little bit mixed. And even though the Times editorial board didn't endorse him, he's correct that, that um, this sort of, and I'm indicting, pointing at myself here with a big neon light, <laughs> like college-educated journalists who do this for a living, think, you know, think differently than your average voter with like a real job that where you get your fingernails dirty. He is, he was correct about that, that there are people in the press corps who were kind of underrating him, but no one in the press corps thought if Biden is nominated, he will absolutely, absolutely lose the election to Donald Trump. What actually happened was that he underperformed polling and he won. Uh, he won by you know, a, a bigger margin than Trump did in 20, in 2020, he won the popular vote, et cetera. But he, he didn't win by 10 points. Uh, and he didn't, uh, win Wisconsin by 17 points, which was one of the the final Washington Post poll, which everyone knew at the time was was wrong. I'm not I'm not attacking the Post. It's, it happens. You get bad data, and you get what are you going to do with it? So he's rewritten the history that he's always been underestimated, and he wasn't. Um, he, 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 he I think he he and Democrats are packing up 
a lot of the negativity they've heard in associating it in in one package. Uh, there, so he's he's bringing in both the, the, for everything from the editorial board being meet, being annoyed with him to Fox News attacking him. He had pretty good treatment for for uh, in the twenty twenty primary, and this is not a twelve hour podcast, so we can't get into the Hunter Biden laptop, but. Was that covered as an existential daily crisis for Joe Biden? The media is looking into the contents of the laptop publishing on the front page every day, et cetera. No, it wasn't. He had he had better treatment, I think, as a as a candidate than um, is that why I went free? Probably than Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. The emails that were published by WikiLeaks were daily stories. The Hunter and it was different because it was Hunter Biden, not the president. But he really did not have that hard of a time with the press in 2020, and he's retconned it that he did. And if you, if you were if you were there, it 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 does not match up with what we what we saw. Again, he really benefited also from Republicans just getting over over their skis and saying he's incompetent, he has dementia, he's going to fall apart at the debate. He didn't. That really helped him. That Republicans, led by Trump, were just assuming he was he was decrepit. Reporters who covered him didn't think he was. And at key moments, he he ran a very sharp campaign. Especially the key moments I'm talking about: George Floyd. Um, the tougher one was Wisconsin with. Um, Jacob Blake getting shot and and the Kyle Rittenhouse situation after that. He he was a very nimble candidate. He just wasn't jumping in front of cameras every day the way that uh, uh, John Edwards would have or, or Barack Obama would have. But yeah, he's turned that into I've always been underestimated. And he hasn't been. <laughs> like he, he The story of the 2019 yeah. campaign was can Joe Biden remain the front runner? Because if he is, he'll probably win the election. And th this is when, uh, th yeah, I mean, this is really the first time he's faced a, a what I would call a hostile press. Yeah. Um, and, he, you know, the another example of the kind of ornery Biden coming out was on Sunday's interview with George Stephanopoulos, which was a tough interview. Um, Stephanopoulos has since said that he thinks Biden should drop out, uh, then kind of walk that back. Uh, I believe he said it to, to a TMZ reporter or something. But um, during that interview, uh, which we're going to play a clip from in a second, Biden told Stephanopoulos that his hypothetical about Democrats, Democrat leadership telling him to step down was fanciful. Uh, let's look at that. If you can be convinced that you cannot defeat Donald Trump while you stand down? It depends if, if the Lord Almighty comes out and tells me that, I might do that. Well, it, I mean, on a more practical level, Washington Post just reported in the last hour that Senator Mark Warner is, is assembling a group of senators together to try to convince you to stand down because they don't think you can win. Well, Mark is a good man. We've never had that. He also tried to get the nomination too. Mark's not. Mark and I have a different perspective. I respect him. And if Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries and Nancy Pelosi come down and say, we're worried that if you stay in the race, we're going to lose the House and the Senate, how will you respond? I, I go into detail with them. I've spoken to all of them in detail, including Jim Clyburn, every one of them. They all said I should stay in the race. Stay in the race. No one said, none of the people said, I should leave. But if they do? Well, it's like, <laughs> they're not going to do that. You sure? Well, yeah, I'm sure. Look, I mean, if the Lord Almighty came down and said, Joe, get out of the race, I get out of the race, the Lord Almighty's not coming down. If you are told reliably from your allies, from your friends and supporters in the Democratic Party, in the House and the Senate, that they're concerned you're going to lose the House and the Senate if you stay in, what will you do? I'm not going to answer that question. It's not going to happen. All right. It's not going to okay. happen. Now let's play a clip of Nancy Pelosi from this morning on Morning Joe, where apparently all Democratic Party business uh, unfolds. John, could you play that? Does he have your support to be the head of the Democratic ticket? As long as the president had the president, it's up to the president to decide if he is going to run. Uh, we're all encouraging him uh, to to make that decision uh, because time is running short. Uh, the uh, I think overwhelming support of the of the caucus. It's not for me to say I'm not the head of the caucus anymore, but uh, he's beloved. He is respected, and people want him to make that decision, he has, not me. He has said he has made the decision. He has said firmly this week he is going to run. Do you want him to run? 
I want him to do whatever he decides to do. And that's that's the way it is. Whatever he decides, we go with. Okay, I want him to do whatever he decides to do. That's the kind of clarity we're always seeking um, from (laughs) our uh, leaders in Washington, D.C. Very noncommittal, but also not that far out from what Stephanopoulos was describing. Where do you think things actually stand among Democratic Party leaders at this moment around this question? Uh, they they are they're not moving minute by minute, but maybe every every ninety minutes. They they are they, they are not stable, and this is this is another thing. But just journalism is still on the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> it's it's still it's still on. Uh, there are newspapers published in the morning. There's TV at night, and so there needs to be a storyline. I'm sorry for being super elementary, but I, I've thought about being. It's the only job I've had, so I've thought about. Uh, how, what do we pack into the 30 minute broadcast? What gets into the newspaper? That is the big question. So I think there have been the days where people thought the story was over because some people spoke out and that hasn't happened because Democrats are still worried about this. What, what are the, in, what are the inputs they're getting day to day? Well, the debate ends on the, the 11 PM on, on J- June 27th. It takes a while for there to be polling in everybody's district that says what's happening. Um, they don't come out and say, I'm having a press conference. This poll just came out. I'm screwed. But they behind the scenes, if you talk to Democrats, they'll say what they're hearing. And so they're getting more negative input after they got some positive input. Some of them were back in their districts. And uh, a couple members I was talking to, uh, one pointed out they were getting told in their district, please stick with Joe Biden. And a couple were pointing out it was the more uh, you know New Yorker tote bag voters were very anti-Biden and the blue collar voters were very pro Biden. Biden went to a black church and got the uh, got a rapturous reception there. It had literally a uh, a preacher just saying the most positive things he could about him. And Biden leaned on that. Biden's leaned on that uh, frequently. I mean, this is he did in the twenty twenty primary too. There were moments when every elite person didn't like him, but he was winning black voters by sixty points. And who are you going to side with, the working class black voter or, or the rich guy? But so they're all getting this information uh, c- contradicting each other. Pat Ryan, the congressman from uh, Hudson Valley, New York, he won a special election in 2022 that I covered. Uh, and he came out saying that Biden needs to leave the ticket. He's from a district that Biden narrowly won in 2020. And I haven't seen his internal polling, but I've heard about Democratic polling in seats like that where Biden is getting smoked. And this isn't because I think in a different era where people split their tickets, it, it would be hit. Di- it would hit differently. There's very little ticket splitting. Democrats are ver- in those places are worried. People are going to come out. They're going to vote against Joe Biden, and then they're not going to vote Democratic down the ticket. Um, even or if they do, it's five percent of voters. It's not going to be enough to save them. So that's what's happening. They're all they're all hearing different things. They're hearing voters who are pissed off and want people to stop criticizing the president. And then they're getting data from non-loyal Democrats, swing voters who like, want maybe not Trump to be president, but are getting despondent and want, and want a different choice. So that's that's what, that's why it's not stopped in a given day. There's not a day where we can say, OK, the dam held and it's over. Uh, and there's not really the closest to an event is uh, the Stephanopoulos was the, the interview was the first one where a lot of Democrats said, I'm waiting for that. Now they're, they're waiting for the press conference. Uh they're waiting for events in public that everyone can see as they get information back home or from pollsters that tells them how bad things are. And that's why it's such a muddle. There's not a day where they line up in a row and say, we've all agreed that Biden must leave the ticket. Uh, it, part part of it's a collective action problem. We went through a version of this in 2016. There were a lot of Republicans who were convinced that uh, not just that Trump was bad, but that he couldn't win the election. And they didn't do that. None of them said, I'm lining up here. We've all agreed that that Bojo, that we are behind one candidate to beat this guy because Trump is so bad. They were just in disarray for different reasons. So that's what's happening to Democrats now. Um, the difference is that they have this break glass option at the convention, and they're wrestling through. Okay, who do I piss off if I do this? And is it worse pissing, pissing off some people if it saves my career? Would it save my career? It's it's genuinely confusing. Not to cover, but their choices are so confusing. There is not a clear. We win the election if we do this plan. What they are getting instead is we will definitely lose the election if we continue with Biden. And uh, that is what that's what they're reacting to. That's why Pelosi waits a couple days. days. Uh, she's, you know, she's in the halls of Congress. You can ask her questions. You can choose not to answer. And she was saying, I'm going to make a statement tomorrow, meaning Morning Joe on Wednesday. Um, 
that's the thing. There's no one in the part. Final thing I'll say in this is everyone agrees that uh, the Biden family are more important than members of Congress in in, in figuring this out. Uh, that were uh, Jill Biden, the by first lady, and Valerie uh, Biden's sister to an extent. Hunter, they are more important, and they're not moved by these Democrats. But every day that somebody says I'm worried about this. Behind between the lines, read they got information that tells them they're screwed if they stick with the guy. I mean, it right. looks to me like Biden is burying his head in the sand and ignoring Maybe. what the polls are pretty consistently telling him, especially over the last two weeks for polls conducted post debate. I mean, I think we saw either mm -hmm. yesterday or this morning Cook Political report downgrading um, Biden's projected performance in six out of like seven major mm -hmm. swing states. Uh, and it looking like Trump's lead uh, is a little bit more solid, or at least like they're increasingly toss ups, ones where perhaps it was projected that Biden would perform better. Say Biden is swapped out with Kamala Harris, who in many of these polls is performing a little bit better than Biden, but not well enough to beat Trump. What would Harris's prospects be in those seven swing states? So this is another thing that they're looking at the data on, uh, and it's harder to predict out. So Kamala Harris has never been that popular. Uh, I guess I kind of start the clock in November 2020. So she had a bad primary that happens. Uh, mm -hmm. She the the issues that hurt her in the primary they've changed. No, nobody is talking about uh, Medicare for all right now. Uh, it's like even even when I talk to Bernie Sanders, he's not saying everyone must be for Medicare. It, it's the the issue matrix changed, but. She mm -hmm. in 2020, she gets elected and her approval rating in the exit polls is bet 48, 48. She's a, a little bit less popular than Biden. She's a little yeah. bit less popular with white men who like Biden. That's the main thing. She has been an unpopular vice president. And this is this is the reasons for that are, are both. She never was that popular uh, and she has flopped in some high profile settings that in memorable ways. Republicans push this a bit. Uh, they were worried about her. They weren't worried about her being incredibly popular, but they kind of branded her early on as the real power behind the administration. When Biden gives her the uh, border portfolio, she's she's the person who's going to deal with the influx of migrants in early 2021. They just pound her da daily over that. Why is she not at the border yet? Why is she not at the border yet? Why are all these crossings? No one trusts her to handle the border. She She was pretty unpopular for those reasons. Uh, and she also, I said both, but the third thing, she just, she, the, the the reason she was a bad primary candidate had a lot to do with just her ability to, to, uh, I don't want to be patronizing, but study up on things she doesn't know and be nimble and get be out, get out of her safety zone and, and, and take risks. She, uh, she never was very good at that. She lost a lot of staff because of mistakes she made. She's gotten better in the last year, and this has been a story of the White House package for people, but having seen her on the trail, it's true. I think if you are inclined to not like her voice or not like her laugh, that will never change. But she is now somebody who has a few issues she's very good at talking about. She has speeches that have been murder murder boarded, and they sound pretty good. Um, she gets crowds, and people are more impressed when they see her. This is the thing that changed. I, I, I covered her in 2019, a lot of times Democrats would come into a room and they'd be disappointed by her, but more excited by Warren or by Booty Judge. And now they come in, they hear they her, they're pretty excited by her. She's she's gotten more popular. What would she do so, if she's the nominee? It's called it's it's complicated because right now she is not the nominee, but the premise of this election is uh a Biden Harris ticket with Biden so old, lots of voters are thinking if I vote for him, maybe uh, she's gonna take over at some point. They're already thinking what she will be like. Uh and she is. She does not have uh, Biden's uh, record of. She came up in a different Democratic Party. She came up California Democratic Party, uh, San Francisco Dem Democratic Party, where she was one of the more conservative, pro police politicians in that firmament. But she never had to win over very hostile, <laughs> like white union workers in Sussex County, like like mm -hmm. like like Biden did. She just has been in a more elite space her whole career, where she doesn't have. Um, she's she's not as, as doesn't get along in quite the same way with unions. It was Biden who walked a picket line, not her, and that was the choice they made. But they could have chosen to send 
Vice President Harris to some picket lines, and they didn't. So she does not have some of his skills. The thing that Democrats think makes her better right now is that's that she has become a better performer. And when they want a message out there, she will deliver and she won't screw it up. Uh, this happened over the weekend. She was at the Essence Fest in uh, in New Orleans and had a very easy interview. I, I can I send Patreon. I just, I just like to be clear. Their interviews are hostile interviews where they just want you to sound good. This is an interview <laughs> they wanted her to sound good. And instead of asking about Biden's age, they were leading into pro- to pro- the tr- threat of Trump. And she delivered the Project 2025 message. The Democratic message is, whoever worried you are, Trump has a plan to destroy America if he takes over. He's going to ban abortion. He's going to ban the abortion pill. Uh, he's going to do the biggest deportation in American history. He's going to destroy the economy with terror. She just did that. She like, delivered that message. And so Democrats have said, are now in a position uh, where they think she is not a good, as good a communicator as some of our, our, our guys. She has not won working class voters like Gretchen Whitmer or Josh Shapiro did very recently. Um, they, they don't win them like Democrats did 20 years ago, but they do better than her. But she can just deliver a message. And if she's the nominee, the contrast would be liberal Democrat, who conservatives would say is the most liberal nominee in history. I think they said about Barack Obama previously. Um, and she will be able to, they think, just be a normal Democrat and run against Donald Trump's mistakes. So Donald Trump will give a speech and will say some goofy things or he'll trail off. She would be a good contrast to that. That's what they think. I think it's still complicated because of how she spent three years working with Joe Biden. She based some questions about was she lying to us about how on the ball he was. But that's their theory. For all of her weaknesses, yeah. she's just going to be a normal Democrat. Like if, we, if they swapped in a random Iowa state senator and just said, can you deliver the message that Biden, uh, that Trump is dangerous and Project 2025 is bad? They could probably do it. And Joe Biden has not been able to. So it sounds like you're partially coconut pilled, uh, Dave. Um, <laughs> it's just like I yeah, saw, right. I saw a bunch, I, a bunch of memes uh, popped up, pro Kamala memes, co- coconut pilled. Uh, this one that's showing the progression from being burdened by what has been to Galaxy Brain, imagining what can be unburdened by what has been. Honestly, the uh, the existence of. Kabbalah memes uh, made me much more bullish on her uh, chances going forward. Have you seen her New Jersey in-laws impression? (laughs) I did see that. The thing that's funny is, Dave, you're talking about her being perceived by parts of the Democratic Party as like a normal person who can deliver the message fairly well, despite some political baggage, especially related to the border. The thing that's so funny is I feel like she's now sort of becoming part of the like pop culture as the kooky wine aunt and it used to be that she just (laughs) had these weird spacey moments and now it's like a little bit of um it's a little bit like celebrated it's a little bit like sort of the relief that people are seeking and so but i i do think that part of the reason why the kooky wine aunt image has caught on is because people are paying a little bit more attention or maybe she has fine-tuned some of her charisma and so there's a little bit of this likability thing that she's worked on and or that people are reacting to where for better or worse, she kind of does seem like somebody who would be a little bit fun to like, I don't know, have a bunch of drinks with, which used to be a little bit of a litmus for how people looked at the president. Like this idea of like, do I want to sit down with this person and share? You're ready to throw back some Pinot Noirs with uh, Kamala, Liz? It would not be Noir. All wine moms and wine aunts do Pinot Gris. You you would always do a white because Uh, you don't want any stains. That makes sense. How do you know? Uh, (laughs) I'm coconut filled only insofar as I think she, she has been so demean that she's now slightly underrated and another thing i've heard democrats say this and i I heard them say the same thing about hillary and they were wrong uh but that she republicans would be unable to resist not all of them but some of the talkers the republican party would be able to resist calling her the the dei candidate which has already happened or calling her stupid or just saying things that are annoying if you are uh disinclined to reward what sounds like racism and sexism like like, arguing that the vice president who is who has held impressive roles uh it throughout her career and won a bunch of votes arguing that she's actually an idiot you can do that it happened to dan quayle um but i i do think they're right that what's it what's a good news cycle in a kamala harris led ticket it is it is a day where she gives a speech and it's pretty good and meanwhile somebody introducing trump at a rally 
uh, calls her the affirmative action candidate or something. That would probably be yeah. a pretty good Kamala Harris news cycle. That's what they're. Yeah, they're, I mean they're doing. They're the writing a lot of fan fiction she, now. That's one of them. Yeah, yeah. The fact she has been so underestimated is probably a, a major advantage for her. Um, to bring this conversation home, you know the, what people are wondering. I think is is this actually going to happen? Are they actually going to swap out Biden? And if so, how would that work? I noticed yeah. that over at Semaphore, you did a little explainer on that, um, replacing Biden. How would it work, David yeah. Weigel? Yeah. Semaphore, by the way, uh, you know, we've had, uh, we've gone on some uh, media rants today, but I think uh, it has a really interesting approach uh, in its efforts to like, very consciously separate opinion from reporting in a transparent way. Uh, so I, I recommend the publication overall, but I was hoping you could lay out some of the concrete steps uh, for us uh, of what would need to happen for a new nominee to be selected and how it would all work. Yeah. The Democrats have elected their delegates that actually happened pretty recently, uh, a few weeks ago. And most of them are committed to Joe Biden, the winner of the primary. But the Demo Democratic bylaws do allow them uh, to be released and vote for somebody else. The easiest way for this to work, if, if they were going to replace Biden, would for, to buy, for, for Biden to say, I am now uh, releasing my delegates to go for somebody else. And there is uh, part of the reason I wrote that story was uh, Heritage, Heritage Foundation has, had put out a memo and then organized a call saying, there would be legal challenges if they try to swap out Biden before the convention. They could try that, but they, none of them really held up. If you look at state laws, they're pretty clear. Um, and I shouldn't say pretty, very clear. They, they say black and white, they say the nominee at the convention they put on the ballot. It, it becomes complicated afterward. Uh, but everything starts with Biden saying, I released my delegates. Right now, they are committed to voting for him. There are super delegates in the Democratic Party who everyone, I think, has heard about by this point. The party rules changed in 2019. Uh, I think the vote was before that. But where if you're like, if I'm the gov if I'm Gretchen Whitmer, I am a delegate to the Democratic convention, but I don't get to vote unless there's a second ballot. And right now, if, if every delegate voted for Biden on the first ballot, then boom, he's the nominee. So you just need to, you need Biden to release his delegates. And then uh, the question has been, would there be a competition where at the convention people are, you, you have your hospitality suite, you, you have your uh, lobbying delegate by delegate, you have a war room calling people up and trying to get commitments and endorsements, uh, or would delegates just move en masse to, to Harris, especially if Biden said, I want you to vote for Vice President Harris and pick someone else as a running mate. It's all doable. Uh, I think the, the Democratic worry has been, uh, one of them has been, Oh, but this would be undemocratic because we already had a primary. Yes, that would you'd have to spin your way out of that. Uh, and the uh, it would be chaotic. It would be chaotic. The media would cover it uh, in it. I, ever reporter, I think, would probably, I think, do a little bit of whining. But this is a thing that no one has covered in uh, generations. So yeah, it would be it would be covered weird. as a real it's contest. Yeah. yeah, there there'd be no news about Republicans for two weeks that makes it in. It's all it's all doable, but it's not doable if, if Biden says I'm running. I want all the delegates to vote for me. There, okay. um, there's there's no the, way the, yeah. to crowbar him out of there. Um, like I, I don't know. I've heard people talking about this in good conscience clause and things like that. Yeah. But you don't wow. foresee something From like that happening. Voting for him to crowbarring him. What happens? <laughs> if there was something that said, if there's a medical diagnosis and he uh, has a degenerative illness or he has X mm -hmm. months to live. Then you get into some of those options. Without that, uh, it is just the nominee, the the person who has the de who has delegates pledged to him in the primaries has those delegates until until the convention. But it would be th those rules are for if if something um, if you have a 1968 situation, somebody wins delegates and then they are assassinated. Uh, then there are rules for that. There's not rules for we don't like the guy, we want to dump him. It needs to be uh, a thing uh, something so grievous that they could not run i mean something imagining like if, if, a uh, yeah. neurodegenerative brain conditions yeah and like i try not to get too much into the the, the speculation because it'd be a little bit gr gross but that's one situation what would happen if the white house says actually we, he has been diagnosed with parkinson's and he's not going to be very mobile and medically he cannot continue to do this but he refuses to step down in that case then, then you get to the defcon one 
um, he's not competent and our rules say he's not competent. That would be the actual delegate coup against the president. That's if they have a list of options, that's way down the list of what they want to have to do. So I want to bring this conversation to a close, but we ask all of our guests this one question. Dave Weigel, what's one question that you think more people should be asking? What is, <laughs> this is the sounds I, what is the president's second term agenda? <laughs> like, I, I, I agree with some Democrats that there's only so much you could ask about his, 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 pre- his, his health. Uh, I don't, I don't think it, the white house has barely done this. What, what does he do in the second term when the tax cuts expire? What does he replace them with? So like, I just think starting there, what is, because we actually have a pretty good idea what Republicans want to do if they take power. We have a uh, project 25, we have the new platform, we have Trump speeches. We don't have, we have finished the job. We don't know what, what Biden would do. So I feel like, yes, if he is reelected, what does he do? What does he pass? What does he, like, what, to, what does he do more tariffs? Does he add, like, does he continue, like, how, if he's reversed by the Supreme Court, how does he use federal dollars to pressure schools into doing things he wants? I don't know. That seems relevant to a precedent. So start, maybe ask that. Dave Weigel, thanks for chatting with Reason. Oh, awesome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.